Let me ask you to open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1. Last week was just introduction to the book of Hebrews. And um, I, I hope that I made a clear enough case that I believe the Apostle Paul is the writer of this book. I don't know of anyone else who would be more a better candidate as the author of the book of Hebrews. And so I'm going to proceed uh, with the assumption, with the belief, and the conclusion that it was the Apostle Paul who wrote this book. The King James translators certainly believed it, and they said in the, in the title, um, the Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews. So I'm going to follow their uh, lead and assume that he indeed was the writer. Let's read the first three verses of chapter 1 uh, yet again. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Verse 1 says, God, Paul begins with God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners. Sundry means many, different. It's still used in grocery stores and in uh, pharmacies, drug stores. They sell sundry items. It means they sell a lot of different things. And divers, from which we get the word diverse, today we spell it with an E, and sometimes it's pronounced diverse, with a short I. Diverse or diversity uh, also means varied and multiple different things. These two words are listed as synonyms of each other. So God, at sundry times, would speak to men and reveal himself to men. Uh, he might speak for a while, then he might be silent for some time. We read in Genesis 16, verse 16, And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. And the very next verse, Genesis 17, verse 1, states, And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, ninety-nine years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, so forth and so on. So God was silent for thirteen years until after Ishmael was born. God would go for periods of silence while the judges ruled over the nation. Uh, and the Lord was silent for at least 390 years after the writing of the book of Malachi, before the coming of Christ. He says, and in diverse manners. That refers to the fact that sometimes an angel carried a message from the Lord. Uh, in Judges chapter 2 verse 1 is a good verse to illustrate that. Sometimes a band of angels, Jacob saw a heavenly host in Genesis 32, in verses 1 and 2. Sometimes it's the heavenly host of angels such as the shepherds, that appear, the angels appeared to the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, verse 13, announcing the birth of Christ. Sometimes a single prophet would speak for God to the nation, one like Ezekiel or Jeremiah, and sometimes it would be a single priest like Ezra. Ezra 7 was a a priest for God leading the nation and speaking for God to the people of Israel. But um, he spake in time past unto the fathers. And that's, of course, going to refer to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the twelve patriarchs, and so forth. Go, if you will, for a moment back to Romans chapter 9. Romans 9. And uh, start at verse 3. Romans 9, starting at verse 3. Uh, 3 through 5. Romans 9, beginning at verse 3. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises, whose are the fathers, 
and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. So God spoke to the Jewish patriarchs, the fathers of Israel, and made promises to them, revealed himself to the world through them. And then Paul writes, hath in these last days, and that expression, last days, throws off a modern Bible uh, correctors and those who will be with critics of our Bible, and uh, so-called scholars today, the last days here turned out to be a period of about a dozen years, beginning with the uh, um, the beginning of Christ's ministry um, and John the Baptist. John the Baptist heralded the coming of Christ and the last days before the coming of Christ uh, in his ministry. Go back, if you will, to the book of Malachi. Malachi 4, the last page in the Old Testament. Malachi 4. And verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Go forward just a couple of pages in your Bible to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew 3 And verses 1, 2, and 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And then verses 5 and 6. Then went out to him Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, and they were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Look forward at Matthew 11. Matthew 11. And verses... Christ says here, verses 13 and 14. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elias which was for to come. But as Jews, uh, the Jews rather, as a nation, didn't receive the preaching of John the Baptist, nor did they uh, embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as a nation when he came. Instead, they crucified him. But, uh, and so God began to turn away his attention from Israel. Go forward, if you will, um, to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 7. Acts 7 and let me begin there at verse 52 here Stephen is testifying and uh, of course it's not going to end well for him but Acts 7 starting at verse 52 which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted and they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Then the last days are spoken of by Paul, referring to the end of the church age. 
and it extends into the tribulation and the second advent of Christ after that. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Those times are here. As we see the church age winding down and everything being put into place and the stage set for one world government and one world ruler to govern over that system. Everything's falling into place and perilous times are here. You probably couldn't have said that with the second coming of Christ in view a thousand years ago when the Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox were arguing over how to make the sign of the cross and silly things like that. Um, was the, are priests supposed to be married or can they, or, or are they supposed to be celibate? And things of that sort. Real important issues, right, that need to be thrashed out. <laughs> but, um, but today, all the technology is in place to track and number every person on earth. It's, just, it's simply a matter of when that chip on your, your visa card becomes something that's implanted on you or in your forehead or in your right hand. And by that, you'll be able to access everything. Brother Lee's showing me his iPhone or his Google Watch. And um, he simply passes over the scanner to make purchases. He doesn't have to get out of his debit card or credit card or anything like that. And so he's almost got the mark of the beast. It's on his wrist. I'm <laughs> <laughs> but um, so the technology is in place now, and it's it's increasing exponentially every six months. It seems to double in its ability to track and follow um, every person on earth. Everything that moves can be tagged and, and tracked. And so we see the closing of the church age fast approaching, and the second of uh, the, the rapture of the saints coming soon. I hope it comes before we finish today. Amen. But um, those perilous times are now. But for, the most, for most of the church age, that phrase, last days, didn't apply. God's Son will speak in the future, but He won't be speaking from earth. Notice, um, this is pointed out clearly later in Hebrews chapter 12. Run forward there. Hebrews 12. And um, verse 25. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. That's future. Now, this future was foreshadowed by Jesus Christ appearing to Paul as a bright light and shining round about him, and then speaking to him from heaven, Acts chapter 9, on the road to Damascus. And so he confesses that his salvation is a type of God once again turning his attention to the Jews, which will come in the future. He says uh, of himself as one born out of due time, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8. Christ had come, he had preached, he had uh, ministered, he had been rejected, by the scribes and Pharisees, he had been hanged on the cross of Calvary and died for sinners, and then ascended back into heaven. And the best opportunity, the, 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 the greatest missed opportunity in the history of the world is when the, the nation, by and large, rejected Christ and, re, and crucified him instead. But then, as one born out of due time, Paul had set about to reject Christ and persecute believers in Christ and get things back to the way they were, and God appears to him on the road to Damascus, Acts chapter 9, uh, and says, Paul, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And Saul was converted to the Lord Jesus at that point. And uh, so he says, One born out of due time. It's, God owed me nothing. He already came and went. We rejected him, and yet he chose me anyway. Saved me anyway. But, um, so let me try to nail this down. Look back, if you will, at uh, Psalm 80. Psalm 80. Psalm 80, 
Psalm 80, um, verses 1, 2, and 3. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up thy strength, come and save us. Turn us again, O God, cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Go back to Psalm 50. Psalm 50 in verses 1 and 2. The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shined. And then I think go forward to Psalm 67. Psalm 67, just one verse there, verse 1. God be merciful unto us, and bless us, and cause his face to shine upon us. Selah. And one thing we noticed in studying the book of Psalms for three and a half years, every time that word Selah shows up, it seemed to be in close connection with the second coming, and the second, the glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um... the appearance of Christ to the Hebrews who are looking for him to come and save them out of their trouble. Um, run forward to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 9 and verses 27 and 28. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment... So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So those Jews who will be looking for Christ during the tribulation, when the man of sin begins to persecute them, hunt them down, they'll realize that everything the prophets had spoken of are coming to pass. Everything their Christian friends tried to warn them of uh, has now come to pass. Everything their ancestors told them about re rejecting Jesus Christ was a lie, and they'll be hunted down like animals by the man of sin and everyone in uh, confederacy with him. Uh, prophecies concerning uh, Christ's second advent to rule the world as King of Kings and Lord of Lords can be spiritualized and applied to his first coming. Notice, if you will, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. And verses 13 through 16. Matthew 4, 13 through 16. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zabulon and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zabulon and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. But compare that with the actual source from which uh, Matthew's writing, go back to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah 9 and verses 1 and 2. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. That's going to be the Gentiles as it occurs in Matthew's account. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. There can be no doubt that the Holy Spirit picked Parts He picked and chose parts of Isaiah's text to apply them to Christ's first coming spiritually. 
But the literal fulfillment of that passage is going to have to be at the second coming of Christ, the return of Christ, at the end of the tribulation to rescue the Jews who are fleeing from the man of sin, uh, fleeing from the Antichrist. And so these last days found in our text today do not begin with Calvary, as it's often assumed, begin with Calvary and then end at the second coming of Christ. They actually begin with John the Baptist and they end in Acts chapter 7 when the Jews begin to reject Jesus Christ wholesale. God begins to withdraw his offer to save them as a nation and become their Messiah right then. See, I think we talked about this not long ago. Stephen sees the Lord Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Why was he standing? Because he's getting ready to come back if the Jews would receive him right then. But they didn't. So he's now seated at the right hand of God, making intercession for us when we pray. And then the, the last days pick up again at the end of the church age, which we're living in now, and they continue through the tribulation into the second advent of Jesus Christ. They begin with John the Baptist, end in Acts 7, then they begin again at the end of the church age, the close of the church age, and end at the second advent. So the Son, verse 2 of our text, he speaks on both occasions. The first time he spoke from the earth, the second time he'll speak from heaven. When he comes back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, there's a whole lot in the book of, we're going to have to come back and just pick up where we've left off in these three verses in Hebrews 1. But uh, we make great application of these verses when we're talking to cults. The Mormons believe that they have a Latter-day prophet. God uh, had restored the, the ministry of prophets with the coming of Joseph Smith. And the, uh, the restoration of the gospel is what they call it. They call their religion the restored gospel. That it, was, it fell by the wayside because of corruption and sin within a hundred years after Christ came. And then it was restored when Joseph Smith was digging around the ground up in upstate New York. He found the golden plates. And he became the new Latter-day prophet and his successors are prophets. But when you, when you encounter someone, you can say to them, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in, uh, in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, and say, you and I don't uh, disagree on that part. But then the verse, next verse says, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. And apply it to right now if you need to. Apply it to right now if you, if you have to when dealing with a Mormon and saying, there's no need for any further prophets. Jesus Christ was the, was the prophet to end all prophets. In fact, I think I have a sermon called Jesus Christ the Prophet. He was not just a, 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 um, a priest and a coming king. He was also a prophet. In fact, Jesus was the greatest prophet who ever lived. But uh, we often don't think of him that way. And uh, so that needs to be pointed out to a cult member, that there's no need for some man to be a prophet. When they go to the Old Testament and say, surely the Lord God will reveal nothing, but he revealed it unto his servants, the prophets. But then Hebrews 1, verse so on says, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. So you have to... Now, technically, Christ spoke in, in the past when he was here the first time he spoke on earth, and the second time he's going to speak uh, at the second coming from heaven. But if you have to make application to the here and now in order to deal with a cult member, by all means do so. Doesn't the Bible say all scriptures profitable? <laughs> Might as well use it that way as well. Whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. You might have to deal with uh, some evolutionist who says it all came together by random chance. And there is no divine uh, intelligence or uh, overseeing it. Well, how in the world do these things operate and function by themselves without any mind, uh, divine mind or intellect directing it? That's why um, it's so absurd to think that, uh, and I've been doing a lot of research into Buddhism, uh, Buddhism claims to be an atheistic religion. They do not believe in one 
grand overseeing God who oversees all the affairs of men. But they believe by your own good thoughts, your own good words, your own good actions, you earn merit. And uh, by enough merit earned, you will one day ascend and become a divine spirit in the ether and bless the people living here on the earth. How that works exactly, who's in charge of that? Who's in charge of granting you a step up? Or another step, or, or, or giving you a step down if you haven't earned enough merit? Who's in charge of promoting you to the next form of life by reincarnation? There has to be some divine order uh, set, set about by some divine mind in charge uh, under which we all operate. But it can't just operate by itself as part of the natural creation of things. That's completely illogical. So while they say they're an atheistic religion, they don't believe in one supreme God, they actually believe in multiple gods, that everybody can become, in essence, a god, and earn divine merit and become one with the universe and become a Buddha themselves. That's a strange, a strange thing. The Buddha claimed that he had been reincarnated a million times before finally coming to the divine revelation that the secret to life is to give up all desire for anything. Don't want anything, and then you won't be disappointed by not getting it. It really, really comes down to. If you have no real ad attachments to anything, then you won't be disappointed if it's taken away from you or, or with, withheld from you, because you're not attached to it and driven by it anyway. And they said, this is the key to happiness. I guess the homeless people are very unhappy because they have too much, right? So, desire leads to disappointment, and therefore that's suffering. But, um, and I don't normally quote other Christian commentators or Christian apologists, because we don't always agree with their positions on a number of things, particularly the scriptures. But Rabbi Zacharias uh, has a good response to some of that. He says, not only does suffering come in the form of pain and misery, but suffering also comes many times by being weary of too much pleasure. And many people who have been rich and wealthy and were the loneliest, most unhappy people in the world, who blow their brains out because they think there's nothing more to life than that. So suffering many times comes from too much pleasure as well as too much pain. But um, the idea that there's no divine God, divine creator who made the world set it in motion, and uh, is, is over, has overseen and understands everything taking place within the world, is uh, completely illogical for a so-called religion or philosophy.